In this video, I wanted to provide a slightly better reason as to why the trace of px is actually equal to p. So in the material thus far, we went on to talk about how the trace of px is necessarily equal to p, the number of independent variables. And I wanted to ex explain why this is necessarily the case. Well, if we think about what the trace of px is, the trace of px is equivalent to the trace of the definition of px, which is just x times x primed x all to the power minus 1 times x primed. And it turns out that the trace operator is actually invariant under cyclic permutations. So in other words, the trace of ABC is equivalent to the trace of CAB, for example. So as long as you permute things cyclically, the trace operation doesn't change. So we can write here that this is equivalent to the trace of, if I take this term here and essentially put it on the end, I've still maintained um, my order sort of cyclically. So this is equivalent to the trace of x primed x to the power minus 1 times x prime times x. And now we've just got a matrix times its inverse. This is the inverse and this is the matrix. And we can ask ourselves what sort of dimensions does this actually have? Well, x has the dimensions n by p, and x primed therefore has dimensions p by n, meaning that this thing overall has dimensions p by p, which means that this whole thing is going to have dimensions p by p. So when we've got a matrix times this inverse, we're just going to be left with the identity matrix, but we've reasoned thus far that this is going to have to be an identity matrix of dimensions p by p. And the trace of an identity matrix of size p by p is just going to be p because we've just got p1s uh, along the diagonal. So I hope that this has provided a little bit more insight into why the trace of px is necessarily equal to 